Well, what a special day and uh, what a joy and privilege it is to baptize our disciples class and to, uh, to be a part of this. I welcome you if you're visiting, if you're a family member, a grandparent, a friend or neighbor, we're glad that you're here. Uh, I will tell you that's quite a workout up there in the baptistry. Um, but we are thankful for this group and thankful for uh, the future that God has in store for them. Please join me in prayer this morning. Loving God, open our hearts, open our minds. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Young Johnny's mother looked out in the backyard and saw him playing church with their family cat. First, Johnny was, uh, was preaching to the cat, and she thought that was cute. Then he got out some crackers and juice, and he was having communion with the family cat, and she thought that was cute, and she went about her business. Well, then she heard this loud hissing and meowing sound coming from the backyard, and she looked out, and Johnny was about to dunk the cat in the tub of water. And she said, Johnny, stop that. That cat is afraid of water. And Johnny looked up and said, well, Mommy, he should have thought about that before he joined my church. <laughs> Today is a special day in the life of Woodmont since it is Baptism Sunday. A baptism is a holy sacrament. And a sacrament is an outward and visible sign of uh, a divine and invisible grace. Through baptism, we seek to be faithful to the great commission of Jesus Christ, who said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. After the resurrection, he gave us this charge, the end of Matthew's gospel, and we are to be faithful to it. Baptism is the beginning of the Christian journey. In no way does it mean that we have arrived. In no way does it mean that, that we have finished uh, it is the beginning. It means that we have made a commitment to give our lives to Christ, to be faithful to his commandments, and to live a life of discipleship. Baptism by immersion uh, is the way that Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. I like to remind my Presbyterian friends of that. But it's not the only form of baptism. We practice believers' baptism by immersion in the Christian church, but we accept other forms of baptism as well because we know that we're not the only uh, Christians. And we welcome folks here at Woodmont from many different denominations and backgrounds. But what immersion symbolizes is dying to an old way of life and being born into a new way of life, a life committed to Jesus Christ. It also symbolizes the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Every year when we baptize our young people, I uh, find myself reflecting and thinking upon what are the uh, words of wisdom, what advice can I share with them on this very important day in their lives. And so this morning, uh, I will be brief, but I have five short things to share with the class of 2015 and also with, with all of you about the Christian faith, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. First and foremost, Christianity has always been about having an ongoing and transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. And that relationship should transcend denominations, it should transcend congregations and church structures and church politics and all the other baggage that organized religion can sometimes bring with it. I can tell you as a minister that organized religion is necessary but it's also very capable of draining your spiritual life because you can get inundated with all the stuff of the church, the meetings and the emails and the budgets and the stewardship campaigns and the squabbles and the politics and the rules and the games and the bylaws. You know what I'm talking about. And many good ministers have left the church in an attempt to save their faith, as ironic as that might sound, because they get tired of all the distractions from the main thing. And the main thing is having a healthy, ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ that change your, changes your life. Many Christians are guilty of getting caught up in theology and creeds and doctrine and stances on social issues that they often neglect the main thing, knowing Christ, allowing him to change your life. 
to change the way you think and act, to change the way that you uh, view other people and, and treat other people. We have to understand what Jesus was all about. What did he teach? What did he say and do? How did he treat other people? What did he spend his time doing? What was most important to him? What does it mean to bring the kingdom of God to earth right now? I think the Sermon on the Mount is a great place to start, Matthew 5 through 7. I think the parables that we studied during the Lenten season is also a great place to start to understand what Jesus' message is all about. As Christians, we know God by knowing Christ and we follow Christ by paying very close attention to what he said and did. Second, Christianity is about learning how to love. Loving others even when it's difficult. Paul writes to the Romans, love one another with mutual affection. I'll do one another in showing honor. To the Corinthians, he writes, love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Love is not always easy. Love is not always convenient. Love is a conscious choice that we make. And Jesus gave us the greatest commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, life is all about love. First John says that we should love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And the love that I'm talking about should be evident in the way that we treat other people, the way that we speak, the way that we interact, the way that we approach life every day. Agape love has been defined before as unconquerable goodwill towards other people, even people that you don't like, even people that have hurt you in the past. You can't have a Christian community without forgiveness and reconciliation. It is absolutely impossible. It won't work. You can't have a marriage or a family or a friendship without forgiveness and reconciliation. It's impossible. It won't work. Christ came to teach us how to love. And sometimes we get it and sometimes we don't. Third, Christianity requires and demands ongoing commitment, discipline, and sacrifice. You know, one of my biggest fears for some time now about uh, Christianity in North America in the 21st century has been that, that it will become a religion of convenience and not of conviction. It will become a religion that affluent people just squeeze into their schedules whenever they feel like they have time for it, but it will frequently take a back seat to other things. And that's what I fear, and to be honest, I see that more and more. This morning, or today, we, we've kicked off our, our, our stewardship campaign, our spring campaign to raise the necessary funds to support Woodmont Christian Church for another year. And two weeks from today, we'll ask you, if you're a part of this church, to to uh, make a commitment to support our operating budget. This is a part of what it means to be a Christian. This is a part of what it means to continue to live out your faith. This is a discipline. It's not the only discipline. There's other disciplines like worship and reading the Bible consistently and developing a healthy prayer life on a regular basis and uh, serving other people and forgiving other people and giving your time and talent uh, and making all these things uh, intentional in your life. It, that really matters. You can't be a Christian alone. Christianity happens in a community um, and we're here to support each other and to love each other and to lift each other up when we fall, uh, to, uh, to forgive each other when we've uh, done each other wrong. That's what it means to be the church. And we all must participate in that community. The young men and women baptized this morning are called to participate in that community. People ask the question in this day and age where everybody is spiritual but not religious, well, what does it mean to be spiritual? What does it mean to grow spiritually? And, and I always go back to Galatians 5 where Paul names the fruit of the Spirit. What does he say? It's love and it's joy and it's peace and it's patience and it's kindness 
generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How are these things manifest in your life, and, and which one or which ones do you need to work on the most? I think that's an important question to ask in this age where everybody is spiritual but not religious. We now live in a time where people are so busy and so preoccupied that they don't have time for things. Now, whether they're actually accomplishing more is a debatable subject, but they're busy. Technology has made us available all the time. And I'm convinced that sometimes the pace of life is so fast that it eliminates an opportunity for spiritual growth and it eliminates an opportunity to connect with God, to be still, to be quiet, to nurture our soul. We have a little um, low log cabin up in Sewanee. Before you get impressed by that, remember we don't have a house in Nashville, but we have this log cabin up in Sewanee. (laughs) And um, it's a place where we go, not only since I've been in school up there, but also just to get away. And it's when I'm up there that I feel uh, like I can connect with God and be with my family and and get away from all the, the hustle and the busyness that the life of a ministry can bring to a place of sanity. Because we all get so accustomed to the fast pace of life that we forget what it means to slow down and to pray and to reflect and to connect with God. Fourth, Christianity calls us to care about the poor. Poverty is a, a devastating thing regardless of the factors that lead to it. And there are kids that are born into poverty every day who did not choose to be in that situation. Uh, I got an interesting book last week written by uh, Harvard's Robert Putnam. Um, it's called Our Kids. Um, I think it's like the, the American Dream Under Fire or something. But he talks about how there are so many children in our country that never have a chance because of situations into which they are born. And Jesus cared about the poor. In Luke chapter 4, he he quoted Isaiah. He said, I have come to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. Paul says, as many of you as are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And there's no longer Jew or Greek or slave or free or male or female or rich or poor, for you all are one in Christ. You see, Jesus was constantly pushing the social norms of his day. And he was also constantly looking out for those who had little or nothing. And he associated with people that were outcasts. And he calls us out of our comfort zones to look after the people who are most vulnerable, to look after the people who have little or nothing in our community. And there's many ways that we try to do that as a church. I mean, we are uh, an affluent church right here in the heart of Green Hills with a really tall steeple that you can't miss from anywhere in town. But you know what that means? It means sometimes we have to get out of Green Hills and go to different parts of our community and serve those who Jesus would consider to be the least of these, serve those who are struggling, help them have food and clothing and shelter, uh, help them to have the basic necessities of life, and we take that very seriously. Jesus cared about the poor, and we're called to do that. Maybe it's a Habitat house. Maybe it's a mission trip like Guatemala. There's a meeting at noon today. If you're interested in going on that this fall, it'll change your life. It did for me. Maybe it's uh, going on the food project truck uh, on a given day or cooking for them. There's all kinds of ways that you can help serve the poor in our community. Lastly this morning, I think the Christian faith is about taking the great commission that Jesus has given to us in Matthew 28 very, very seriously. To go and make disciples of all nations and to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus gives us a promise. He says, remember, I am with you always until the end of the age. If your faith is strong and if it's changed your life, then I hope you will find a way to share that with other people and not just keep it to yourself. St. Francis once prayed, Lord, help me spread and live the gospel and only use words if necessary. Live out the Great Commission. Go and introduce other people to Christ, not just by what you say, but by what you do. Let your Christian love be evident in the way that you live. So to the disciples class of 2015, I say congratulations, we're proud of you, we love you, 
We're here to support you, not just now, but in the years to come. You are beginning a lifelong journey that will be full of ups and downs, full of times when you feel like you understand faith and times when you question faith. But you need to know that today was a very important step and today is... Amen.